welcome to Half Hour of Heterodoxy, featuring conversations with scholars and authors and ideas from diverse perspectives. Here's your host, Chris Martin. Deb Mashek is my guest on today's episode. She's the executive director of Heterodox Academy. We'll spend this episode talking a bit about what Heterodox Academy does on a day-to-day basis, so it might be of interest if you're a member or if you follow us on Facebook or Twitter, but you're not sure about what our activities actually are. We also talk a bit about events and activities that are planned for the year 2020. Deb Mashek, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Chris. It's great to be here again. Now, a lot of our listeners are new this year. They know this podcast is produced by Heterodox Academy, but they might not know what Heterodox Academy actually does. In fact, some of our members might be curious about that too. So on a day-to-day basis, what do you and the team in New York do? It's a great question. I mean, the, the organization's name is quite a mouthful. And of course, heterodoxy is the opposite of orthodoxy. So we're, in a nutshell, advocating for more viewpoint diversity and open inquiry in higher ed spaces. So bringing more heterodox perspectives. And uh, in terms of how we do our work, we get this question all the time. Um And we really organize our work in terms of four bins. So the first bin is we try to increase public awareness about why open inquiry is important to higher ed in the first place. And so efforts like this amazing podcast. Um, And also we have a blog where we're publishing original articles, at least, you know, once a week, um, active social media channels where we're trying to to share heterodox perspectives on what's happening in higher ed. Uh, Those are some examples in that first bin of increasing public awareness. And then, of course, we also engage with the media. We're talking to journalists, um, writing op-eds, things like that. In terms of the the second area of work is we try to create tools and resources that professors and administrators and others can actually make use of on campus and in their disciplines. And I I think maybe we'll have a chance to dive into some of those and some of the big plans uh, here in a little bit. The third bin of work is we try to find the amazing role models to hold up, whether these are institutions or individuals or groups, people who are doing great work in advancing open inquiry, finding out what they're doing, and then amplifying their good work. So um, for their, for instance, we have the HXA Open Inquiry Awards that we give out each year. And just as a, a heads up to everybody, um, we'll be putting out a call for, for nominations here in about a month for those. Um, and then we're also starting a new initiative called HXA uh, Distinguished Academies. And so I would love to talk more about that uh, after after this little overview part two, um, and then the fourth the fourth bin of work our fourth area is that we try to create communities of practice. And so whether this is by gathering people at conferences or smaller events or even virtually um, through, for instance, the HX Communities Initiative, it's a way of connecting scholars within a discipline scholars within a particular region, like there's one for New Zealand that's very active. Um, And also people who have particular professional interest. So for instance, we've just started a K through 12 heterodox community group. Um, I, you know, I would love to, for instance, have an HX librarians group. So there are all these different uh, areas of expertise that connect to advancing the heterodox uh, institutions, especially in colleges that were trying to get those people together to, to have conversations to figure out what they could do together to affect change. And Heterodox Academy, I just realized, is almost five years old in about nine months. It'll be five years old. And it started out as just a couple of people. How many people are now working at the head office? Well, it, and it's interesting. So it as you know, because you were one of the people there, I always yeah. describe the the origin story as like three dudes in a blog, um, where there were these, you know, you and sociology and John Haidt, Nick Rosencrantz, and others thinking um, at the the same time, but in different disciplines about the the role that. Uh, ideological orthodoxy was playing in the scholarship area. And then you guys started this blog and people started to say, hey, we want to be a member and just things developed pretty organically. And then um, what was it? I think I don't have the calendar or the timeline in front of me. But at, at some point, John hired um, John Haidt hired a couple of people to hang out in the in his office at NYU and help with some of the logistical pieces. And then um, 
uh, you know, the, the real kind of hiring and staff development approach kicked off in 20, what was it, January? I feel like it was 2017 or late, late 2016, early 2017, maybe. I think it was 2018 when I actually, um, I think it was January 2018 that I accepted the position as uh, executive director. And so like a year ago, there were, I want to say four and a half full-time staff. And by the end of the spring, we anticipate being at 11 full-time staff. So we're, we're growing quite a lot. Um, and, and the idea is to bring on not just capacity and good thinkers, but real professionals who know um, how to support members, for instance, like what, what do our members need and how can we create value for our members as an organization, how to run events, uh, how to, you know, like we've got so many projects going on um, that we need pro- a project manager to help orchestrate all the moving parts. And I think of her as sitting in the, you know, in this like the air traffic control tower and watching how everything's coming in and what needs to take off and getting all the timing um, exquisite. So quite a team. They're amazing. Um, and, and we have a little co-working space here in New York. So we get together every single day and hang out in the same room and do what we can to bring more viewpoint diversity to college campuses. And let's say I'm a faculty member who has just joined Heterodox Academy and knows very little about it. Whom should I know about in the head office? Like, whom should I contact if I want to know more about events or about how to manage my classroom better? Uh, great question. So your first point of contact would be Christine Richards, who is the memberships manager. And you can reach her at richards at heterodoxacademy.org. And um, she would be happy to connect you with our existing initiatives, resources, and so on. One of the things that those of you who have been members uh, historically would have received over the past month or so was a little, uh, finally, a little packet that has a membership certificate in it, as well as a list of 25 things you can do to advance heterodoxy on your campus this semester. And so if people join, um, we're working on getting those getting those mailings out. So everybody has has one of those to hang on their wall um, to, you know, to talk about their engagement with Heterodox Academy, but also to see some concrete actions that you can take. And in terms of events, I'll say that our uh, website is <laughs> is oh, not a great resource right now. So we're developing some updates there. Um, but we will, you know, we drop events on there as they, as we get them scheduled. So for instance, um, on, let's see, December 19th. So next Thursday, we're, we're, or, or the Comedy Cellar here in New York City is having a benefit show for Heterodox Academy. And so all the ticket sales will will go straight to a Heterodox Academy as a donation. So if you're in the New York area and you're available Thursday night, you can come out and see us. Unfortunately, I won't be on the lineup for that show. Oh, wow. Well. Um, <laughs> I'll send you a selfie. Okay. <laughs> that sounds good. Um so in terms of the Distinguished Academy honor, tell me a bit more about that, because that is actually new. So what is that about? Yeah. So, okay. So do you remember the Guide to Colleges? Yeah, I remember that. That was around about, well, Sean Stevens started to work on that. And he released that shortly after he started working here. Yeah. So it was a really cool idea. The idea was, how can you... um find out how well colleges are doing in creating these atmospheres, these contexts uh, where open inquiry can thrive. Um, but it, it's kind of a tough question because you have to think about like, what are the the useful data sources that are not anecdotal? So like, it's hard to say, oh, we're going to use um, newspaper coverage of a student protest or, you know, if a professor says something that's silencing to students and it was caught on tape, we're going to use that as evidence. That's totally anecdotal. And of course, we're, we're researchers. Um, and yeah, so- I mean, I had that issue at Georgia Tech, actually, because a Georgia Tech alum out of the blue, someone I didn't know emailed me and said, how come Georgia Tech is ranked so low on the guide to colleges? And it turned out it was because of one story. It was a true news story, but it was it was about a police car being set on fire during a small riot. But it's unclear if the people who set fire to the car were actually Georgia Tech students to begin with. And on a campus of 20,000 people, that doesn't really represent the whole campus anyway. Exactly. And if you put your mind or yourself in, say, the shoes of an administrator, 
what, you know, what does it feel like to have your college hung out to dry because of the action of um, one person who may or may not be a student, but something took place on your student? So it's just, it's like we weren't feeling confident in the data sources that were going into these rankings. So we made the tough decision to take that tool down. Um, it was actually one of our most visited web pages on the entire site. And we said, you know, this is not something we can, we still feel like we can stand behind. So we took it down and we started this other initiative. It's going to be a slow build. We're at the beginning, but we would love ideas um, and participation from, from members, from listeners. Here's the idea. So HXA Distinguished Academy, what we'll do is create a list of criteria that we believe uh, characterizes a campus where um, where, where I, people can come together who can interrogate ideas across lines of difference. So in other words, what does it mean for a campus to advance open inquiry? And it might be things like, well, you know, there's a speaker series and people from a lot of different perspectives are invited to um, to look at a particular topic. It might mean that a campus circulates some recommended syllabus language about, you know, all ideas are welcomed in this classroom that, um, you know, you're not going to be graded on your ideas. Instead, you'll be graded on the quality of thought and your effective deployment of evidence. Like, so we have some syllabus language like that. And maybe, um, maybe that becomes one of the criteria or maybe another criteria is something like, Oh, during the first year orientation, there's some effort to talk about academic freedom or open inquiry or how to handle discomfort. Or maybe they assign the amazing open mind platform in a, a shared core course or something like that. So we're going to come up with a list of of criteria. And then we're going to put out a call to uh, colleges and universities and say, hey, if you want to distinguish yourself, your institution in this incredibly important area, here's how you do it. You're going to share your direct evidence with us that you're doing these things. And you know, I can't imagine we're going to be like, oh, you have to hit every single cri- every single one of these criterion. But we'll have to design um, some sort of a, a process for, for vetting, for evaluating, for, for scaling and figuring out which institutions really are doing a phenomenal job. And then we want to crow about them. This is all part of our, you know, our holding up the great role models. We want to share their stories with others um, through, you know, whether it's through social media on our website, certainly it would be awesome to eventually get some of the the campus leaders from those institutions onto the podcast to bring positive light to the good work they're doing. And in terms of the HXA communities, that started out as HXA disciplines. So if you're on Facebook, you can find out, you can, if you're on Facebook, you can find HXA psychology and HXA sociology there. But now we're moving to communities. So tell me about Australia and New Zealand, because I feel like I've done a poor job of serving people in Australia and New Zealand, at least in terms of <laughs> representation. I've not had anyone. Yeah. I have had people from Canada on the show, and I'm originally from India, so I guess I'm partly representing the Commonwealth. So you're representing, not very yeah. well. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what's so, going on in Australia and New Zealand? This started as HX Disciplines, and here was the big thought. It's like, you know what? Let's create spaces where the psychologist can get together and talk and figure out, you know, share resources, but also say, hey, there's a a conference coming up. Let's put together a panel of heterodox perspectives on this topic. And we were thinking pretty narrowly about who would be interested in something like this. We're like, oh, it's going to be our disciplinary colleagues. As soon as we launched this effort, we started to get outreach from um, like geographic Places. So New Zealand, Australia, higher ed leadership, K through 12 educators, um, community college scholars. And then, you know, we're like, well, this whole disciplines focus probably is, is too narrow. So we opened it up to HX community. So you're right. That's the history of it. Um, in terms of, for example, the HX New Zealand and HX Australia, this summer, John Haidt uh, was on, did, did a, a leg of his book tour. Um, over there and spoke to a lot of academics. And understandably, when you get people together, there's often this energy of like, we wish we could continue doing something together. We wish we could activate on this energy um, in some way. But what often happens is you get that energy and then it dissipates and there there's nobody there to help organize or to kind of synthesize the ideas. And so while John was in New Zealand and Australia, there was all this energy and 
and, and so we just when he got back, he's like, we've got to figure out a way to, and you know, to make sure we stay connected with these folks. And so we just set up another, another group and um, you know, th- they're talking about everything from public policy around education. Um, one of the, one of the groups uh, classics, they, they worked together to co-author a letter that they signed then as individual scholars, but uh, the, the, one of the real movers and shakers from that classics group is also a New Zealand scholar. So that work has been um, highlighted also over in the New Zealand group. All right. So we're recording this on the 12th of December. So if you follow us on Twitter or on Facebook, you've probably seen some posts already about our new advisory council. So tell me about who's on that council and how you selected those people. Yeah. So the purpose of the advisory council um is to offer support and guidance in the HXA mission. So these are higher education leaders and public intellectuals who have chosen to stand with us in support of open inquiry and higher ed. And if you look at the the list on the website, it's phenomenal. There are 15 people there, um, including current college presidents uh, like Ron Crutcher uh, from University of Richmond. There are public intellectuals like David Brooks from the New York Times, uh, diversity officer leaders like Taffy Benson Clayton from Auburn, Um, And she's on the the board of the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education, for instance. Some high-profile professors, including Robbie George and Glenn Lowry, Rick Schwader, Cornell West, Nadine Strawson. Um, Other organizational leaders, including Lynn Pascarella, who's the president of the Association of American Colleges and Universities, Ibu Patel, the president of Interfaith Youth Corps, Urshard Manji of Moral Courage College, and then uh, you know other higher ed leaders like Judith Shapiro, who's the past president of Barnard College, but also the Teagle Foundation, Diane Halpern, who's the past president of the American Psych Association, and Alice Drager, who uh, I, I think many of you know won our Courage Award um, back in, in 2018. And she's the, the author of Galileo's Middle Finger and, you know, has been in many ways uh, a victim of she would never clarify, classify herself as a victim, but she, her life has had professional consequences due to orthodoxies on campus. So she's an amazing advocate for this work. And the idea is that we'll be able to turn to this advisory council when we have um, questions and when we need some, some support or advocacy for these ideas out there in the broader world. And I should mention a couple of things. One is Nadine Strassen is also a former president of the ACLU or former chair of the ACLU. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for for highlighting that. Really amazing to like read through these bios. And I mean, I just feel an incredible sense of personal gratitude to these folks that they're that they endorse what we're up to. Um, and then I know I know it means a lot to our members too to have have people like this uh, who who can help give social permission to stand up and and be public about your support for open inquiry. And a shameless plug, three of these people have also appeared on the podcast. Unfortunately, they were in the days when our audio quality was not great. But for people who've just started listening, we do have past episodes with Glenn Lowry, Rick Schwader, and Alice Drager. And I remember the Alice Drager episode was recorded the day before I defended my dissertation. So oh, that man. will be November, November 2017. Does, does that count as a light bulb memory? Yes, I guess it does. <laughs> Uh, I recorded both. Uh, I recorded two Heterodox Academy episodes, or two half hour of Heterodoxy episodes that day. Um, and then Glenn Lowry appeared prior to that. I think Rick Schwader appeared prior to that too. And I think those two episodes are on video and audio, so you can find them on YouTube as oh, well. Oh, that's right. I forgot that you used to do yeah. the video and you could see what was in everybody's background. Yes, back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just four years ago. Feels like a long time ago. Um, I, I said four years ago, it's two years ago. It feels like four. Amazing. Yeah. Time flies. All right. So 2020 events were, uh, 28 days from the beginning of 2020 as we're recording this. What events are we doing in 2020? 
in store for 2020, thanks to the work of our membership manager and also our recently hired events planner, we're going to see a lot of different event formats that will be distributed across time, across geographies, across interest groups and formats. And so while our big conference will remain a cornerstone of that event plan, it's now going to occur every other year. And what's cool about this is it's going to create the space for us to do a have a more sustained cadence of activities to really engage our members in conversation and in collaborations that are going to improve the campuses and the disciplines. And these include things like uh, we're starting a salon series where we're going to be bouncing around across the nation and doing small in-home events with uh, donors and members where there'll be conversations about difficult topics. Um, but we'll be able to, it'll be, give us a chance to really show versus telling what heterodoxy looks like and feels like. And if you are interested in hosting one of these events, please reach out. We would love to hear from you. And we're also looking at how to do more virtual events, things that people can just drop into from the comfort of their own home and interact with us and interact with other members. So these include things like digital town halls on particular topics. For example, if you're, um, you know, would like to brainstorm with others about possible, you know, conference panels that you could put together around heterodoxy, or if you're getting ready to teach a first year seminar on um, a writing seminar, for instance, how can we infuse those courses with heterodox perspectives and modes of thinking and, and think together alongside other people who are getting ready to teach those sorts of courses. And so we can have a discussion. We're playing around with the idea of doing virtual book clubs, perhaps in collaboration with a half hour of heterodox podcast where maybe we, you know, maybe Chris, we could do a book club and then maybe you interview the author or something like that. So the sky's the limit. And one of the, the things we would like to know from our listeners and our members is if you have particular ideas for topics or formats or other ideas that what, what you need um, to, to feel very much a part of and a contributor to the heterodox community, let us know. We're in, we're in a very, um, brainstormy, generative space right now and would love to hear from you. Great. And to wrap up, since we're on a podcast and you listen to some podcasts, including one that you appeared on recently, uh, which is Two Psychologists, Four Beers. What are some of your favorite podcasts, either heterodox or non heterodox related? Uh, okay. So I, I'm not one of those people who has like a podcast going at all times, but I do have a couple I'm listening to. One is called Strong Songs. And it's this musician who breaks down songs that we all know and love and figures out why why they work so well. And he loves music. He's incredibly enthusiastic. Um, but if you want to hear all about Dancing Queen from by ABBA, you got to go such a good episode. Anyway, love him. Um, another one I'm really enjoying is called Dharma Punks NYC. And it's, uh, it's this Buddhist teacher, scholar, therapist who talks about um, Buddhist perspectives on everything from, you know, developing interpersonal connection to dealing with stress. And one of my favorite, favorite episodes, I um, was back in October, and it was titled Interacting Skillfully with Irrational People. It would totally appeal to our, our heterodox listeners. Um, and so anyway, very much enjoying that one. Let's see, you already mentioned the two psychologists, four beers. I'll say those are my recommendations. Well, and of course, I, I can't go to sleep at night until I've listened to PBS NewsHour. So that's my my primary source of news and analysis. And then uh, I I would be remiss if I neglected to mention the How Do We Fix It podcast. So these are people who have been very close to Heterodox Academy and who also have supported us. And we've done some, some co-broadcast episodes with them. And I love it because Jim and Richard come at the questions from very different perspectives. And they do it with such incredible goodwill and open intention that they're creating amazing conversations with their guests. So I would totally recommend the How Do We Fix It podcast as well. Great. Well, Deb, thanks for joining us on the show. It's been great having you for our annual What's Up with Heterodox Academy episode. And uh, for people who don't follow us 
on Twitter or Facebook, I'd recommend doing that too, because that is a good way, apart from the podcast, to figure out what our activities are, what our events are, and what our goals are. And Chris, if I can just say a heartfelt thank you to you for all the work you do on the Half Hour of Heterodoxy podcast. You're one of the one of the public faces of this organization, and I would say one of the unsung heroes of helping get the word out about why why these issues matter so um, intensely, both for higher ed but beyond. Thank you. Well, thank you. You can learn more about our activities by following us on Facebook or Twitter or by visiting our webpage. That's heterodoxacademy.org. Of course, I also announce events on the podcast from time to time. So if you're a podcast listener, you'll probably hear about any events that are of interest to people in the U.S. or abroad. As always, I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. It would be great if you could leave us a review on iTunes as an end-of-the-year gift. It helps other people find out about the show, and that's useful to us. Also, if you have any feedback about the show, feel free to get in touch with me. You can reach me at podcast at heterodoxacademy.org or on Twitter at chrismartin76. This podcast is produced by Heterodox Academy. Find us online at heterodoxacademy.org, on Twitter at HDX Academy, and on Facebook.